Hi, this is Paula Glory, and this show is called Farther Down the Rabbit Hole because we like to go into topics more deeply. Today we're going to go deeply into the topic of psychoanalysis, feminism, and Sigmund Freud. And in order to go into this topic more deeply, I'm joined today by Dr. Lucy Holmes. Thank Hi, you. Paula. Thank you for joining me. Very happy to be here. Uh, what I like to do on my show is give my viewers information that makes their life better, even though sometimes it can be controversial information and a little bit discouraging, but to come out with uh, an ending where people feel empowered, that they're better for having known that. And so when I started to work with, with Jane, Dr. Jane Goldberg and then eventually help her produce a series on uh, group therapy, um, she was talking about the unconscious and the, the aggressive drive, which is something that usually is uncomfortable to even think that there's such a drive. And I was wondering if, and, and so I think that might seem kind of bleak to some people, and, and I found it's controversial. Not all therapists uh, believe this is so. Some even believe to put your attention on aggression makes it grow. And uh, so I'd, I'd like to uh, have this, by the end of this 58 minutes, have it something, particularly in the area of feminism, and the, any misunderstandings that you feel might have arisen because of this therapy not being understood? Well, I think that uh, aggression exists. Uh, so does libido, so does love. But it's usually the aggressive drive that gets people in trouble. So uh, modern analysts like to help people find a way to use their aggression creatively. And this is particularly important for women because women are trained and women are sort of, um, for a lot of different reasons about the difficulties of, of growing up female, they, they are trained to mute their aggression, to redirect their aggression toward themselves rather than toward the outside world. So um, I think we don't see aggression as something inherently bad. We see it as an energy, mm -hmm. as a force, which can be used for ill or can be used for good. But the Greek word thanatos, does that mean death? Yes. And I, maybe that's what people don't like to think about, that there's a death drive. Right. Well, that was one of Freud's most controversial right. theories. And not all analysts believe that there is a death drive. Freudians, though? Uh, Wouldn't Freudians there are, kind of There are to? Freudian analysts who, who just cannot accept that concept. Oh, really? That there's part of us that wants to die. Uh -huh. And another thing Jane told me that uh, even more important than Freud's discoveries about sex was at the latter part of his life about mass hypnosis. Mass hypnosis? Yeah. Do you know anything about that or is that just Jane's? I've never heard that term mass hypnosis. Well, maybe that's the wrong term, but that how groups could be influenced. Oh, yes, yeah, sort of uh, uh, mobs. Mobs? Mobs can, groups of people uh, tend to regress to the most primitive thinking. Is that a Freudian concept? Yes. And does that have to do with Thanatos? I think that has more to do with, with aggression than dying. Thanatos is the idea, uh, at least as Freud framed it, that we all have a tendency to want to return to an earlier state. Uh, because it's familiar? Yes. And the desire to, to uh, go back into the womb. And where it's cozy where or it's you were cozy, protected? Where it's cozy, non-stimulating. This is the death drive. See, I had heard that the womb was pretty cramped. <laughs> I guess it depends on, on uh, how big you are. How big you are. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me, let me just say, my under, if we can come do a close-up, I went to the public library. And, and incidentally, this book was donated by the, uh, the Carnegie Corporation of New York uh, on behalf of the men and women that were lost in the events of, of September 11, 2001, 9-11. So if you come in on this, this is Hyman Spotnitz's book, which really is a very exciting read, actually. And it's called Modern Psychoanalysis of the Schizophrenic Patient. And, you know, that's kind of a scary topic, you know, schizophrenia for your average person. So, but what I was so um, 
amazed about was that he talked about cure and yes. that Freud felt there were some incurable patients and he, it just didn't sit right with Hyman Spotnitz. That's can right. You, can you talk about that? Freud thought that schizophrenics were uh, uh, incurable, that they, they were hopeless candidates for psychoanalysis. And he felt that way because he believed that uh, the transference, that is, the feelings that the patient had toward the analyst, had to be positive. That, that what was curative was a positive transference that the patient, positive feelings that the patient had toward the analyst. Schizophrenics don't have positive feelings toward therapists. In, in fact, they probably have no feelings. They're very busy confusing their minds. Now, no feelings and narcissism means they're so absorbed with themselves, they're not even aware of the presence of anyone else in the room? That's correct. And that's why Freud felt these people are unreachable? That's right. So how did Hyman Spotnitz? Hyman Spotnitz developed a theory about schizophrenia, which is a very interesting theory. Have you heard it? I think I have, because I read part of the book, that they turn their aggression in on themselves to protect the world that they love. That's right. It ha it, schizophrenia, the dynamic of schizophrenia, is, is uh, established very, very early in life. And Spotnitz had the theory that the infant needed to protect the mother from the, the infant's aggression. And so uh, if things were really wrong, uh, and, and it's not always a, a terribly toxic mother, a terribly sadistic mother. Spotnitz said sometimes the fit between mother and baby is just not right. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be a very active, angry baby and a mother who likes peace and quiet and, right. and is afraid of aggression, that's a misfit. I see. And the baby begins to realize that its needs are not getting met. And it gets angry about it. It gets frustrated. But it's, it's not free to express that aggression directly toward the mother. So the infant, and this all happens intrapsychically and unconsciously, the infant takes the aggression and the frustration that he's feeling because of this mother that he's a misfit with and turns it back on his own mind. And when that happens... It because he's afraid he's going to destroy his mother and then he would rather definitely destroy, be no milk. That's right. He would rather destroy his own mind than destroy the mother who gives milk. So when that happens, it, it destroys the ego. It destroys cognition. It destroys logical thought process. And you get, um, you know, in schizophrenic episodes, you get what we call word salad, where they're, they're speaking, but you can't understand what they're saying. You get hallucination. And that's, uh, in Spotnitz's theory, this is aggression turned against the self. I see. And again, in looking through the book or reading it, he said that as an analyst, you have to time your contact with the patient very carefully because you don't want to fan up too much aggression because then it blooms into hallucinations or... Right. Spotnitz came... Freud worked with interpretation. Mm -hmm. Freud had the idea that um, if you could figure out what the trauma was, you could say, oh, the reason that you have all these hysterical headaches is because you wanted to have sex with your father. Freud had the idea that if he could deliver that information to the patient, that the patient would say, oh, I'm cured, and say, thank you very much, good doctor. It doesn't work, it doesn't really work with anybody. You know, we're gonna do a role in, you're not gonna see it now, okay. about the Hollywood version, where you're describing that. Okay. She's being told this. But yes. that's the Hollywood version? It doesn't work that way? Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. I have patients that I've worked with for years, and they can tell you their dynamics. And do you think they're true? Yes, they're quite correct. I have a woman who suffers. She's a very fortunate, wealthy, beautiful, intelligent woman, but she suffers. And she'll say, the reason I suffer is that my mother suffered and I don't feel close to her unless I suffer. She can tell you that. Right. It doesn't do her a bit of good. Uh -huh. So Freud believed in interpretation. He wasn't really a very good clinician. He was a much right. better theorist. He admitted that, didn't he? He did. He did. Right. 
Spotnitz uses totally different techniques, not only with schizophrenics, but with, with uh, narcissistic personalities. And they are more... Um, Excuse me, for the well, people that are channel surfing, what's a narcissistic personality? That's a, a person who, uh, for whatever reason, has not developed a strong, steady ego. And so they find it difficult to cope with the world. They have a very impoverished sense of self. And in a sort of a sad attempt to heal themselves, they become totally self-involved. They don't see other people as objects who are different than them. They usually see other people as just a part of their inner world. So interest and care for others is actually an example of a strong ego. Yes. I see. It's a great mental accomplishment to be able to love. Hate always comes first. Before you can love? Infants hate before they can love. Really? Yes. When the breast doesn't appear, when they're hungry, they feel aggression. A rage. It isn't until they can hold ambivalence in their minds and realize that the mother who didn't show up on time with the breast is also the mother who feeds them. Mm -hmm. and, and that ability to hold love, and, well, to hold hate and then this other feeling, which is budding love, is a great accomplishment. It's a great maturational leap. Many people never make that leap. So Spotnitz being a good clinician, unlike Freud, he did things that Freud didn't do. He did. He, he I didn't want to deviate you from the narcissistic well, definition, I, but I wanted to make sure that everybody's following because this is right. so important. Spotnitz used communications that, that are, um, they are symbols of the mother, the good enough mother, holding the infant. And some of these, t he, he joins, he would join the patient. Join means you empathize with them? Or? You, you uh, if, if the um, patient says, my mother is a snake, you would say, what kind of snake was she? I see, I see. Uh, that's, that's a very um, <laughs> symbolic technique. Um, <laughs> Why I just have to interrupt because I was watching Spotnitz uh, deliver a lecture in 79 and he talked about one patient who said that out on the Hudson River was a ship that was completely covered with shit. <laughs> 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 and, and at the end of his therapy, you know, when he's cured and he goes home, he goes, now tell me, did you really believe it was covered with shit? <laughs> But he didn't contradict so, him, right? Yeah, it's that he was, I guess, that I don't think he used the term joining, but as you're describing it, he must have joined with him for who knows, a year to go along with that's what is the ship's covered with? Right. Yeah. So that's one technique. Another technique is mirroring, where um, you say that the patient says, I feel totally hopeless. And the analyst says, I feel hopeless too. So you, the 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 therapist holds up a mirror to the patient. This replicates what happens in the early uh, mother-infant situation when the infant begins to know who he is by looking at his mother's eyes. He sees himself in the eyes of his mother who mirrors his gaze back to him. Oh, wow. So these are very, uh, these are techniques that tend to try to replicate the earliest experience that we have in life. Now, my understanding, when you say, if the patient says, I feel hopeless, and the analyst says, I feel hopeless, is the analyst actually feeling hopeless? Sometimes. Sometimes. Now, I thought that Hyman Spotnitz was saying when a patient, you, you reach a certain point and you want to get rid of him. You think he's not getting anywhere, he says he's not getting anywhere, you feel discouraged, he's discouraged. And he said that might be counter-counter transference. I don't know how many counters, but that it, the feeling I got, maybe I'm wrong, is that that might be the time just not to discharge the patient or say it's hopeless, but that actually You're getting the somewhere. analyst is picking up something. Right. This is another that even the analyst wants to run away from. 
That Why? was the point. And he said it would take self-analysis or a good supervisor to work through that. Right, you need a good supervisor, and this is why all analysts need to have their own analysis, because you need to discriminate between which feelings you get when you're working with a patient that belong to you. For instance, mm. if I feel guilty, I know that's my feeling. I've, I mean, that's my template. That's, where, that's what I go back to, guilt. So, but if I'm feeling worthless, hopeless, that's data for me. That's something that's coming from the patient, that's being induced in me, and it's, it's a form of communication. My feelings then become a very important tool to understanding the patient. Now when you have those feelings, is that the patient transferring his feelings to you? Is that transference or not? That's another thing. It can, the feelings can be a feeling that perhaps the patient's mother had toward them. If I'm getting a strange feeling and I go, oh, this, this patient is talking about how much she loves me and I want to strangle her. Now, where is that feeling coming from? Is that, is that a feeling maybe this patient's mother had toward her? Is that a feeling that this patient is, is pushing down and warding off by telling me how much she loves me? That's, and that's what good supervision is for. You take these strange feelings that you get in the session and you talk them over with, with another analyst and you try to decipher what are these feelings telling me? Are they, are they things that are telling me what I need to work on in my own analysis? Or is this information about the person that I'm sitting with? And do you ever get confused? Oh, of course, all the time. Really? Absolutely. And what do you do, just? Well, you, you, you try to figure out what's confusing me. Pe people are always confusing. Now it seems he suggested with the schizophrenic, he used units of communication. I can't remember what the exact term was. He said... Contact function? Yeah, that, that a schizophrenic couldn't take too much stimulation. Right. So I would imagine in a, in a sort of a scary case like that, when, you've, when you know that there's a lot of pent-up aggression and that eventually it has to be faced, you have time to just, as they're talking, if they keep talking... Have you dealt, first of all, with schizophrenics? Yes, I have, and, and the institute where I was trained, uh, it's a requirement to work with schizophrenics for two years. And what was the experience like? Did you cure the schizophrenics? No. Was that discouraging? Yes. But that was not my mandate. I was a, a pretty new student in the field of psychoanalysis, and I was sent to the mental hospital to do nothing but observe. I was not supposed to be therapeutic. The, um, the idea was that you sit with these people and you observe them. And, and we, would, we would have supervisors who would encourage us to use the techniques that Spotnitz recommended, like mirroring, joining. There's another one called the contact function. Right. And that, the, the idea behind that is you only speak when the patient directly contacts you or asks you a question. And that's sort of like uh, symbolically again. That's like feeding on demand. Right. You know, you don't Unless want you see the patients dying. He says sometimes you can interject if they look like they can't handle the silence. Then you can say, how is the silence for you? Right. And if the patient says, I hate it, I'm dying, then you say, well, shall I talk? Uh-huh. So you keep giving them some hope. Well, you, you just try to keep working with them exactly where they are. So the point is to keep talking, to say everything. That's, yes, that's the goal, to and, say everything. And Spotnet said you can never say everything, but you keep trying to say everything. Does to say everything mean to come across what the deepest things are, not that you actually say everything? I think, I think it probably uh, is a way to get people to say what's Uncom what they're pushing down, what they don't want to know. But it also is an indication of something that I believe, which is that the act of talking is inherently therapeutic. So that... Because you're starting to manifest, right? You're getting all the sensory input and it, it's an opportunity for you to put out a creation. 
Well, you know, there's so much, I don't know if you've read, uh, there's so much fascinating research right now in neuroscience because we've reached a point with technology where we can watch the brain in action. And what's so fascinating to me as an analyst is a lot of the things that they're discovering about the brain, uh, they indicate exactly what Freud said. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about this. The human brain is actually three brains. We have a, a, a very primitive brain uh, at the sort of at the base of the skull here that is essentially no different from the brain of a dinosaur. It, it generates impulses. That's all it really does. A reptilian does. brain. They a call reptilian it. brain. Yeah. And then wrapped around that, and uh, the brain that evolved much, much later, is the limbic system, and that's the mammalian, mammalian brain, and that's where uh, mammals began to be able to take care of their young, and to have feelings, feelings but not thoughts. And then in the human brain, sitting on top of the reptilian brain and the mammalian brain is this tiny little thing that's evolved in the last 200,000 years or so called the cerebral cortex. And this is, uh, this, the development of this brain allowed language to develop. It's where logic resides. It's where ethics reside. It's where thoughts mm, reside. Ethics. Feelings come from the mammalian brain but they're processed into thoughts in the upper, the cerebral cortex. Mm -hmm. So, but what's interesting to me as an analyst is that the electrical impulses pulse upward from the lower two brains. The, the cerebral cortex has very little influence on the two primitive brains. And so it, this is why we have such a hard time controlling our behaviors. Oh. Uh, why we do self-destructive things. Why willpower can't change it. Why willpower can't change it. But it's, it's when you think of the brain uh, biologically and physically, it really does sound like what Freud called the id. The reptilian brain is really like the id. It's where all the primitive um, fantasies of killing and screwing mm -hmm. come from. And then the, the uh, cerebral cortex is the ego, what Freud called the ego. And he said the goal of psychoanalysis was to strengthen the ego. And I think that talking strengthens the cerebral cortex. Okay, now on that note of talking, this is your book, if we want to come in on this, The Internal Triangle. You talk about your, your contribution to take Freud farther than penis envy right. was these introjects and culminating in a woman giving birth to a child. Could yes. that be a type of um, expression? Uh, what, like, to give well, birth to a child? It, you don't think of it as speech, but it's, it, it's your putting your creation out into the world. Oh yes, birth is, is extraordinarily empowering for women, particularly if it's not disguised by drugs and technology. Uh -huh. If it's a family-centered spiritual event, birth is a developmental milestone. It, it is incredibly maturational for a woman. Um, I don't think I want to go into it too much because it's a little academic about the interjects, how you, mm -hmm. or, or do you think you can go through it? For the, for the uh, astute viewers, the well, academic Well, now if I get viewers? too intellectual, will you stop me? Yes, I will. Okay. <laughs> I first became interested in the way the, the uh, female mind works. Oh good, because Jane was talking about that. Yeah. At, at, I have had two children and I really felt, uh, particularly after the second birth, that my mind had changed. And, and I sort of felt like, you know how at the end of adolescence, you go into adolescence as a child and you come out of it completely changed. Mm -hmm. This is how birth felt to me. Mm. So I wanted to study, now why would that be? So I worked for two or three years with pregnant women, just talking to them. And the first thing that struck me is when you sit with a pregnant woman, there are so many ghosts in the room. She's there, but her mother is there. 
Mm. Her mother is very alive and vivid in her mind. Many women express the idea that they're afraid of pregnancy because it will turn me into my mother. And if that idea is too awful, women all often have trouble conceiving. Wow. But the other fascinating thing was not only was the mother there, very alive and vivid in, in the woman's mind, but her father was there too. I'll, I'll give you an example. There was a woman who uh, found out that she was carrying a boy. Mm -hmm. She had a very uh, aggressive and sadistic father. And as soon as she found out that she was carrying a boy, she became obsessed that this baby was going to kill her. She projected this internalized, aggressive, and sadistic father onto the fetus and became convinced wow. that this baby was going to hurt her the way her father had. So I, I watched this over and over. Now, with these kind women. of thoughts are coming from the mammalian brain? Because it doesn't seem very logical, does it? That, it, that a the child the in the womb feelings, is going to kill you? The feelings are coming from the mamma mammalian brain. The thought that's connected, this child is dangerous. Right. Like my father was but dangerous. The, but the point is, with willpower, you can't control it. That's and if right. you try, you're going to turn the aggression in on yourself? That's right. So if you hate yourself for having those thoughts, you're in a bigger mess. Right. Okay. So, and again, I think that the idea of verbalizing that thought helps you gain control over it, mm -hmm. over the impulse. I see. Just, just the, the, the fact of verbalizing, you have gotten control of a very primitive electrical impulse that otherwise could run your life. So, I became so struck by the fact that all these women seem to have inside their brains on a fantasy level, an internal triangle of a father, a mother, and themselves. And there were all kinds of relationships that worked out with this triangle that had to do with the baby. But the fascinating thing was once they talked about this, had all their fantasies, and then pushed this infant into the world, literally, going from a fantasy infant who's going to hurt me like my father, or um, um, going to be uh, control my life the way my mother did. All of these fantasies that were in these women's minds, when they gave birth, the, the, the child went from being this fantasy object to being a real object over which the mother had control. And this was very empowering to them. And you felt that? is equal to, that nullifies penis envy? I think that women use those internalized objects the way little boys use the penis. Mm -hmm. You know, the penis is very handy <laughs> because we all have to separate from our mother. You know, everybody starts on this earth with a very powerful woman who can feed us or let us die. And we all have to find a way to separate ourselves from that powerful woman. And boys have a much easier time because they've got a manifest sex organ that shows them that I am not my mother. <laughs> Little girls don't have that. And I think that's one reason that they tend to fantasize that mommy is in me. They interject mommy because if they do that, they can control her. You see that with and little girls. And that's why they like dolls? Yes. You see little girls playing with their dolls and pushing their little mm -hmm. carriages, they have uh, absorbed mm -hmm. the power of the mother into themselves. And they do the same thing with their father at the end of the Oedipal conflict when the father rejects them. They, they absorb that father and, they, and on a fantasy level that father is within. And that's why women, you know, women are known for empathy and an ability to identify and uh, female intuition. Mm -hmm. These are all um, um, characteristics of the fact that women have a very lively unconscious. It's full of all these objects. Whereas the boy just resolves it with having to deal with his father? The boy resolves it by um, uh, creating a duality. I am not my mother. I am nothing like my mother. And it tends to make little boys see the whole world as I am the subject 
and everything out there is the object. Now, that's not necessarily bad. That kind of dualistic thinking invented science. Right. It, it built and the Taj Mahal. And it's not narcissistic, is it? No, it's very, it's but it's, it's thinking. Freud could deal with someone like that. <laughs> oh, Freud was very, <laughs> he was very right. dualistic. He, he yeah. didn't like narcissism. No, he didn't. Yeah. Because he didn't know how to cure it. He felt helpless. Yeah. I don't want to jump ahead, but he said, what does woman want? Is it any, what, any bit related to that? Or, he, or do you finish up your thought and all? Well, no, I finished my thought. Freud, Freud, uh, as you said earlier, his whole idea about women was that they lacked a penis, and that was the reason for all the negative things we associate with femininity, passivity, masochism, narcissism. Mm -hmm. That was his idea. But he also said he didn't understand women. He said, my theories about women are incomplete yeah, he and fragmentary. It, he? Yeah, he did. And he said, I'm leaving it to perhaps a woman to help us understand women because I don't understand what women want. Did Anna Freud uh, add to any of the knowledge? Not really specifically about women. She was such, she was her father's daughter mm -hmm. and um, she made, now there's a woman who made an enormous ad identification with the father. She had a very powerful father interject, and she, um, or she was, was it, very... Or was it foisted on her, you know, that the world was so longing for Sigmund Freud, and the boys maybe weren't interested in carrying on the family business? <laughs> for whatever reason, she adored her father and strove to emulate him, and she pretty much, uh, she didn't diverge from his theories. Uh, very. He, she spent a lot of time in England defending his theories against people like Melanie Klein and Winnicott. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. what, what was Melanie Klein saying against him? She wasn't saying anything against him, but she, she had a very different... Um, she, she is actually the person who invented the concept of introjects that I was just uh -huh. talking about. I see. Of the infant um, ingesting the mother with her milk. Um, Freud wasn't really very interested in the pre-Oedipal period. Now, when you came to modern psychoanalysis, it seems as though to me, uh, and uh, you know, I know very little, uh, what is striking about classical versus modern is that Spotnitz wasn't afraid to talk about cure, which yes. seems so gutsy. Isn't it? Yeah. Now, when you came to modern psychoanalysis, you weren't a schizophrenic, so what were you looking for, and why did you come to modern psychoanalysis? Well, I was an actress when I first came to New York. And um, some, one of my actor friends told me, oh, if you're an actress, you need to have an analysis because your, your body and mind are your instrument. And analysis will help tune them into a Stradivarius. So, ah. so I began an analysis. And I got tired of the life of an actor being on the road all the time. I wanted to have a family and children. And I became fascinated with analysis. I found it absolutely fascinating and I had seen some significant gains in my own life. So I, I decided I wanted to, um, this was actually after the birth of my first child, and I felt extremely empowered. And uh, I think in the midst of all that creative energy, I decided that I wanted to change career paths and I, I decided I wanted to become an analyst. Wow. So, um, talk more about the Hollywood version. Now that I realize you were an actress, you must have a lot well, of feelings Hollywood about Well, the Hollywood version that. of, of um, maybe not so much today, but certainly those classical movies right. like The Snake Pit and, and the movie with uh, Monty Cliff playing Freud, they, had, they used Freud's model that if you were mentally ill, there was some trauma that had happened early in life that you had, because it was so traumatic, repressed into your unconscious. And if you could just remember this trauma and talk about it, you would be cured. Uh, and I think in, in, we were talking earlier about the snake pit. Mm -hmm. At the end, the psychiatrist explains to her what happened. And is that supposedly? I think so. And did that she, cure her? She's happy and yeah. likes him. And I wish it were like that. Hollywood ending. But you know, co cognitive 
explaining and interpreting doesn't touch the brain where the problem is. The problem is the relationship between all those primitive impulses and your ego. Mm -hmm. And what cures? Oh my, I guess we'll be talking about that for the next hundred years. You know, Spot, did you hear what Spot, how you knew when you were cured? No. Somebody asked him, Dr. Spotnitz, how do you know when, when a patient is cured? And he said, a patient is cured when they come in and they say, I love my life, I love my work, I love my wife, I love my children, and I love you. Really? Then they were cured. That was his definition of cure. Now, but if he took things farther than Freud, you'd think that the cure would be, I love my life, I love my work, I love my, you know, wife, children, and I don't like you. <laughs> because it seems Freud didn't like not being liked and thought the patient had to like him to be cured. Right, Freud did not like But not But it seemed liked. as though Spotnitz could sort of handle. Oh, yes. Spotnitz was very comfortable with being hated, but that's that's why... Is that mid-process? Would they eventually like him? Right. It, it follows that same path that an infant does. Uh -huh. he, he wanted the patient who was struggling with narcissism or schizophrenia or mental illness to hate him because you have to hate mm -hmm. and not kill the object of your hate, but right. have the object stay there with you while you're hating them before you can learn to love. Right, right. Um, there's somebody in the control room, Shanti. I think you were talking about some kind of um, herb that's supposed to cure schizophrenia. If you feel you can um, chime in while we have this great opportunity. I'm, I'm interested in Freud as the biologist of the mind or the brain and these, these models of, um, you know, phys physiological models. Uh, right now, there's a lot of interest, and I'm coming across a lot of information about cannabis and this non-psychoactive as well as the psychoactive parts. And I was listening to an interview with Dr. Mishalom in Israel, who discovered THC in 1964, uh -huh. talking about how some um, particularly creative people who might have depression and they're medicated for it become very unhappy because they feel they've lost access to their creativity. When, they, when they're psychoanalyzed? Not n n when they're medicated. And that, that's what was interesting to me about Hyman Spotnitz's work because it didn't involve medication. Or he's so beautiful about how you so judiciously use it so that you can have the person autonomous. Right. Do you have any thoughts about medication? Uh, I, I will recommend that a patient see um, a psychopharmacologist if I feel that that person is a danger to themselves, if, they, if they're really suicidal, or possibly a danger to others, uh, I, I will recommend that they be evaluated by a psychopharmacologist. And I do believe, um, early in treatment, that some people need symptom relief. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't psychoanalyze someone if they are so distraught and distressed that they're going to jump out a window. So, of course, you, you send them to the psychiatrist, get them on an antidepressant that's effective, but I don't see it as a, as a, a permanent solution. It's, mm -hmm. it's a, when you break your leg, you need a cast for a while. It's, uh, it's something that's very useful when the situation is acute, but the goal is to, is to be able to live your life without being drugged and just masking symptoms. Because there's, that, that's not a really savory and, and joyful way to live your life. Right. No, I, I understand what you're saying, sort of a balanced approach. Um, I also have heard that some of the antidepressants are highly addictive, but you'd never know it because a lot of the way it's prescribed is saying that there's something biologically flawed with the person that needs it and will be biologically flawed for the rest of it. Maybe they don't use the word flawed, but yeah, something that requires them to have this medication for the rest of their life. Are you aware of that? That, it, I, that it's being pushed or marketed that way? Maybe pushed is too hard a word. Yes, I am aware of that. I, 
um, this is another like pest. like like addiction would never come up if you because if right out of the gate you're saying you have something missing in your physiological makeup right so and you, this is replacing it so right. just get used to it but we know now again thanks to all this new neurological research that talking can change brain chemistry I think it is quite true that if you're depressed and you may have gotten depressed for purely emotional reasons but the chemistry in your brain will alter because of that uh, depression uh, different chemicals what, what is it serotonin mm -hmm. and there's another one whose name escapes dopamine. me dopamine dopamine right you won't produce those things because you're depressed now this this depression may have been caused because you know your mother beat you up for the first 15 years of your life but you will have a brain chemistry problem uh -huh. however that doesn't mean that that's a life sentence. Um, there's a guy named Eric Kandel, who's a wonderful uh, neurologist, and he, he said he wants to study now how talking in psychoanalysis changes the brain chemistry, because he believes that it does. Right, Spotnitz was very elegant in writing about that, how it's such a delicate chemical, I don't know, he obviously didn't use the word laboratory, but but that the correct words at the right time could change the chemistry so profoundly. When I first started analysis, I had terrible allergies. Just, you know, in the spring it was a nightmare. And about four or five years into the analysis, I noticed they were gone. And it was like the dew evaporating on the grass. It wasn't, it was very subtle, but they, they disappeared. Hmm and I was able to go off my allergy medication and they, they right. didn't come back. Right. So if the mind and the body are connected, it seems as you can approach it from two different ways. Yes. Like uh, I, I know, I've heard of people using the low-level radioactive stones and having some t terrible allergies and then I think in this one case this lady put them on her eyes and her eyes all swelled up and she was very terrified but it was some toxins coming out I guess of her sinuses and perhaps it was some type of fungus inside and that the radioactive stones uh, you know make this fungus perish but she had no um, symptoms after that That's now in if she had gone through had your experience would the psychoanalytic revelation be such that the electrical patterns in the body would change that could no longer the fungus couldn't live in it if that if if indeed it was fungus in the sinuses you know the the as you said the connection between mind and body is so incredibly intricate and you know people will say oh i have a headache and it's not psychosomatic <laughs> it doesn't mean if if you have a headache because you're in a very unhappy marriage it doesn't mean that the headache is not real Right, right. Psychosomatic illness is real. People right. get ulcers. People right. have allergies. Um, right. People have asthma. These are real. You you can see on the X-ray that right. you know this this lung is infected with with asthma. Right. But that doesn't mean that there are not emotional components contributing to that illness. And I, I'm a big believer in in working at something from a variety of angles. We're such complex beings. We are our chemistry, but we yeah. are also our feelings. Right. Because Jane talks about giving nutritional support to people that if, if you're not nourished properly, right. just on the physical level, you can't think that well. Right. And it seems as though you do need a lot of, of uh, mental energy to enter into analysis. I mean, a schizophrenic, it, it seems, you know, you think of them as very alive with a lot of feelings yes. and a lot of expression so there's energy there but handling it to in such a way that that energy is channeled to the cure must be very uh, a very delicate process yes do you think because of medication you don't see such expressions except temporarily until they put some pills in them I think medication has revolutionized uh, uh, the mental health field. For good or for bad? Both. I, my personal prejudice is for more bad than good. Um, 
we particularly in the um, in the hospitals, we we drug people into a stupor. Talk about death into oh, a death-like state, right? Because right. they bug us, and you know they're noisy and they're right. frightening, and they're frightening, and they they can hurt you. They're scary, yeah. and so these patients are drugged into a stupor. It, it's a it's like a near-death state. Uh, Spotnitz was talking about one patient he dealt with, and her diagnosis had changed from uh, aggressive to uh, what? What would else? What other? Was she schizophrenic? Eventually schizophrenic, and also hitting catatonic. Manic depressive was there too. Oh wow! But he was saying um, not to be too stuck on the diagnosis. Right. Can you talk about that? Just well, modern analysts think that the diagnosis, first of all, we don't like diagnosis. It sort of puts a brand on a person. Mm -hmm. and, and I see diagnosis as extremely fluid. Even within one analytic hour, a person can demonstrate uh, narcissism, depression, maybe a manic, you know, they might be manic -y. So I'm very, of course, we have to give patients' uh, diagnoses because we want to be reimbursed by insurance companies. But I think of, I think of that. Oh, that's sad, isn't it? Yes, it is sad. That, that the economic system is sort of twisting the, the process. And, you know, a diagnosis is a label. Mm -hmm. And people are infinitely more complex right. than any one label. Right. What, what is schizophrenia? How do you see that definition what would be it's happening? a thought disorder uh -huh. it's where the the brain literally scrambles itself it's like static on a television can't think straight S spotnets was talking like a toxic uh, experience and that if you can find it the cure could come rapidly that that would do the scrambling set something into motion and right I think that with some of the techniques that we talked about earlier the idea was to make the patient comfortable to give the patient the idea that the analyst and the patient are one which is the idea that the the baby has that the mother and and he are one that if the breast appears it's because he the baby conjured it up there's no, there's no object and subject there at the very beginning of life. So we try to replicate that and make the patient comfortable. And then little by little, I think Spotnitz would try to titrate the aggression. Not too What's much. What's titrate? Let it be released slowly and carefully because there's a, a terrible problem with uh, overstimulation with schizophrenics. And if they get overstimulated, they go back to the schizophrenic defense. They get more confused, uh -huh. more regressed, more decompensated. And so the first goal is to make the patient comfortable. Excuse me, what's decompensation? Decompensation is losing it. Losing it? Yeah. So to be compensated means that you are gaining things from the environment that satisfies you so you stay engaged? Yeah, and you, you have ego strength and you can think rationally. That's a compensated person. A person screaming down the hall, tearing off their clothes and talking gibberish is decompensated. I see, I see. But he could see through that and, and to see that there was a cure, that all of that was, I don't know, fluffed isn't the word, but I mean, he, it was, he seemed to tune into something. Maybe love? Did he just love people so much? Well, the, that, that he wasn't distracted by the behavior? You know, the process of psychoanalysis is an act of love. Mm -hmm. To focus on another with no agenda of your own, but to try to understand the other person is an act of love. But Spotnitz used a lot of hate, too. He, you know, he, his goal was for his patients to, he knew that the aggression was bound up and turned against the mind. So his goal was to get hateful, feelings and impulses verbalized in the session. Then they could be owned. They could be owned and they could be discharged into the world. If the patient is angry at me, it's uncomfortable. But you know that that's a good thing. That's a therapeutic thing. I had a patient who was extremely paranoid. 
to the point of being psychotic. She felt that uh, her neighbors, if, when when were her neighbors spying on her. were spying on her, <laughs> the phone was you know was was tapped. A, tapped. Extremely rigid, paranoid defense, and as I worked with her, she got angrier and angrier at me, and she told me every week, not only in individual session, but in a group, what a lousy, good-for-nothing analyst I was. Every word that I uttered, she told me it was stupid, boring, <laughs> meaningless, but as she did this, her life got better and better. She was able to work again. She no longer felt that the neighbors were spying. The paranoid, the paranoid structure just disappeared. So as she was expressing her aggression and venting on you, she got better? Better and better. How did you take this? <laughs> Come well, on, be honest. <laughs> it wasn't easy. I, it was easier in the individual sessions. I felt very publicly humiliated mm -hmm. when she would attack me in the group, although I always joined her. And I, I would say to her, now, I have to ask my consultant, did I do the right intervention? And she would say, no, it was terrible. And I'd say, what was wrong with it? Well, first of all, it wasn't very bright. And secondly, it wasn't very sensitive. So it was, you know, it was hard to listen to. But I was very excited by the fact that she was able to go back to work, that her husband wasn't afraid of her anymore, and their relationship was mending. You felt something unbounding, I felt, unbinding. I felt an energy that had yeah. been bound, right. releasing. And I was very pleased about that. Ah, uh ah. -huh. Uh -huh. So you looked beyond something like and I had a lot of supervision <laughs> uh -huh, I see a place to go in and complain okay now speaking of supervision and so on uh, what uh, what do you have to say about what feminism has done to, to the understanding of Sigmund Freud in the world was was he was his knowledge about ready for all of that attacking to go on uh, and we can go on to other things or well I, I felt Spotnitz didn't seem like a chauvinist, but he didn't much deviate from Freud except taking it farther to say the narcissistic patient can be cured. Right. I think I, I consider myself a feminist, mm -hmm. but I, I think that... You were an actress and... Um, you know, and I, yeah. I, I want to empower women and understand women, and, but I think that there's a certain faction in feminism that's been wildly ungrateful to Freud. He was a product of his time. He was a Victorian, Viennese gentleman, and he lived in a time of incredibly repressed sexuality and incredible oppression of women. He himself actually invited a female analyst into his inner circle, Melanie Klein, not Melanie Klein, um, Hel Helene Deutsch and Karen Horney. He, he encouraged the careers of some brilliant uh, early analyst. Was he, were his ideas about women a little misguided and now extremely outdated? Of course. Mm -hmm. But I think that, um, I mean, his, his, the scientific purity of his mind, I think would be fascinated with everything that's happened in uh, neurology with, with new ideas about female development. I think he would have been very open to that. Um, and I think that the techniques that he gave us, the idea of, of the fact that there is an unconscious, that we all have the desire to love and to hate, um, he gave us so many tools that we could move forward to understand people um, that I, I can't say that I, I want to throw him out right. and say Freud is dead. Well, you know, after having these insights through Spotnets, who built on him, I certainly have a deep appreciation because I'm convinced that it's not only there, I think it can be taken out onto the internet. You don't have the mental hospitals that you do in the old days. Right. I mean, we do have them, but I'm just saying there's a lot of people in their little houses by their computers, you know, with a whole lot of energy processing and very, very little guidance going on, and even some. Uh, not such socially conducive aspects, pedophilia sites on yes. YouTube and things like that. And I think it would be a great opportunity to, to take some of these techniques into a new environment. 
How do you see that? That's a fascinating idea. Well, I think I was tipped off when uh, Josie Oppenheim was was at one of Jane's salons where we gathered at her house to watch m and n playing the show and then commenting it on af afterwards. And she said, oh, well, the camera's another transference. And I didn't really know what transference meant then, but it, it sort of excited me because having uh, a public access show for a number of years before the Internet, once I went to India and then came back with uh, what eventually became a daily show, I posted it on YouTube. Now, at that time, I remember my niece, who was 17 or 16, she goes, whoa, Auntie Paula's posting on YouTube? She thought it was just something kids did in their bedroom. <laughs> so, you know, so I was doing that, and what was really exciting was um, if television is passive, because, you, you know, unlike reading where you, you know, you're using your eyes, you're flipping pages, and you're thinking a little more, I... Uh, Posting on the internet and then having the blogging meant that it was not only passive that you're watching it, you're actually, even more than reading, you're actually formulating a comment and putting it in there. Mm -hmm. So your input is there and it changes the whole dynamic. You're not just a broadcaster but you now also can pick up on what people have responded. You're interacting. You're interacting, yeah. We have a, I'm a, on the faculty of a, a school called the Center for Group Studies, and there's an online group. And people from Germany and Israel and London participate in this online group, and it's, it's interactive in that people post and then they're responded to. And uh, I've never been part of the group, but I've been curious about well, it. Well, curious, that's, yeah. that's good. Well, I, that, I must say from Spotnitz, I really appreciated how cautious he was. And I learned, I think that's the skill I gained, is to be a little more cautious. What was he cautious about? Uh, well, he said the patient might kill you, and I thought, well, what's he talking about? And then I realized he was dealing with psychotic patients. Right. So he would be careful. And anyway, I'm afraid we're coming to the end of, of our 58 minutes, and it's, it's just been so nice. Do we have a minute or so left or no in the control room? If we do, we might get that comment from Shanti. Or we might do it afterwards. Um, you, you can't get that comment because it was related to another uh, c another situation. It wasn't the schizophrenia. Oh, I see. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. So anyway, this is Paula Glory, and this has been an episode farther down the rabbit hole. Thank you for joining me and Dr. Lucy Holmes. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Paula. It went by so quickly, didn't it? <laughs> I enjoyed it. But we know now, again, thanks to all this new neurological research, that talking can change brain chemistry.